Good morning. This is uh, day 242. We're looking at Ezekiel 13 to 15. Um, these chapters are fairly straightforward. Ezekiel is prophesying against uh, first the prophets of Israel, then the elders of Israel, and then the city of Jerusalem itself. It's interesting that um, he breaks that up, that uh, God focuses on the prophets. He says, uh, um, you know, the, the prophets have a great... Um, responsibility and he says woe unto you foolish prophets who follow your own spirit and have seen nothing they claim that they prophesy from the Lord but they don't and you know um, I, I am concerned that there's a supposed spirit of prophecy among some who proclaim themselves prophets or others do and um, then when they get things wrong there's a way to try to explain themselves out of it but the fact is you know, the, the prophets in, in Israel and Judah, very often they prophesied very simply. Um, some were, were more specific than others, but in general they said, look, here are the judgments of God that are going to come. And um, um, as we looked at uh, J uh, Jeremiah before, but um, he says, you know, uh, in verse 16, he says, uh, the prophets of Israel which prophesy concerning Jerusalem and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, says the Lord. Ezekiel is, is mirroring Jeremiah, saying, look, you're saying everything's going to be okay, and it's really not. And um, interestingly, at one, t at one point he says, uh, uh, your kerchiefs also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted. Um, you know, he says, even the clothes that you wear are going to be torn off of you. Um, there's a spirit of vanity that he speaks to. I think it's very important that we, like the Bereans, that we test the spirits of those who would prophesy uh, among us, those who would foretell particularly, um, but even those who would say, hey, this is about your life now, um, that we test those spirits and make sure that they're uh, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And then he speaks to the elders of Israel, and this is really uh, both uh, a spiritual and somewhat a political um, office of an elder. Um, and he, he says, he uses a phrase here, God uses a phrase, he says, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. And <clears throat> the point of idols was that something was outside, it was controlling you know, a, a, piece, a, a piece of wood, a piece of stone, a piece of metal that had been shaped, these things or, or things in the heavens. And uh, they were formed because uh, they, they were attributed power outside of the um, person of the individual. But in actuality, God says they've taken the values of those idols that they supposedly worshipped on the outside um, and they've transferred them so that now they're a part of them, a part of their heart. And he really takes the elders of, of Israel to task. He says, repent, turn yourselves from your idols, turn away your faces from all your abominations. And basically he was saying, hey, there's, there's secret sin that you're holding on to, that these values have become a part of you. Um, not just uh, the worship of the idol, but the thing that the idol supposedly values. If it's a, uh, an idol of fertility, you've taken that sexuality into your heart. If it's an idol of uh, fertility for uh, provision, you've... Uh, taking greed into your heart. Um, if it's an idol of control, you know, you've put your children through the fire. And, and the fact is, he says, I'm going to bring a sword upon the land. It's going to go through the land, and I will cut off man and beast from it. I will send a pestilence in the land. Um, and toward the end of the chapter, he begins talking and using uh, the example of uh, uh, Noah and Daniel and Job. This is significant for a couple of things. One is Noah and Job were... Uh, very ancient um, examples, but Daniel was a current example. Ezekiel knew Daniel. He certainly knew of Daniel, and Daniel's fame had already been in the land among the Jewish people um, for uh, his righteousness and his honesty and his uprightness before God. And he uses Daniel as an example with Noah and Job of those who were righteous. And that's significant because as opposed to the elders of the land, Daniel, who was relatively young uh, uh, at this time of Ezekiel's writing, uh, was well known as a person of righteousness. But he says, even if these three, Noah and Daniel and Job, were in the land, 
Um, they could only deliver their own souls uh, by their righteousness. Their children would not be saved by their righteousness. They're not their sons or daughters. Um, they wouldn't be saved from the sword. They wouldn't be saved from the pestilence. Um, they just wouldn't be able to deliver them out of the judgments uh, that are coming. Uh, the famine and uh, the beasts that were going to overrun the land as uh, some of the protectors were taken away. He says these four judgments they would not be able to withstand the uh, the pestilence or the, the plague of some type, uh, the, the beasts, uh, the famine and the sword. All of their children would face the same thing uh, because you have to have your own righteousness in order to stand before the Lord and uh, the, the righteousness of the parents wouldn't do. And he uses these three examples, and I, that, that's significant for us. Uh, we too have to stand before the Lord. It's not based on what someone before us has done. And our children and our children's children have to stand before the Lord on their own also. And then the last chapter, he, he talks about uh, Jerusalem being really a, a useless branch. He says, uh, uh, you know, if you took that branch among the trees of the forest uh, and you just took a branch off, it, it wouldn't re really be good, be good to use for any work. But then if you put it into the fire and then took it out, then it's really useless for work. He says, what good is it then? Um, and he, he says, this is Jerusalem. Jerusalem was of no worth uh, among the, the nations of men. It had become a useless vine, a useless branch. And then it's going to go through the fire. So what righteousness does it have then? What good does it have then? What value does it have among the kingdoms of the world? and particularly toward the kingdom of God. He says it really doesn't. And Ezekiel's phrase uh, uh, that, that he wrote down, where God says, I will make the land desolate because they have committed a trespass, says the Lord God. The term desolate there is um, frightening because uh, desolation means there's, there's nothing growing, there's nothing of value there at all. To the nation, to the person, to the soul who says, I will go my own way, the Lord says desolation is the end part of that. Not only a, um, a great judgment, but a uselessness in this world. Everybody wants to have purpose. Everybody wants to be useful in some way. And God says the only way you're going to find that is find it in me. Um, now, uh, Ezekiel goes on in some other chapters and, and gives more hope, but this is still the the area where he's talking about um, judgment. And we need to take this very seriously, no matter who we are, whether we're uh, someone who is known among the community as being spiritually minded, a prophet, or someone who is uh, known as being a person of influence, an elder, uh, even someone who has great spiritual influence. Uh, we can't uh, uh, rest on our laurels. We can't ex expect our children even uh, to follow the Lord because we do, or we can't be expected to follow the Lord because our parents did. We have to seek the Lord for ourselves. And in him, we'll find the opposite of desolation, which is bountifulness, a, uh, a beautiful place, a beautiful land, a soul that is free and uh, prosperous and uh, has great blessing and shares that with others. The Lord bless you today.